In this episode, you'll learn about the two different types of meetings, process-oriented meetings and mission-oriented meetings, how to use meetings to increase leverage, and how much time you should spend in meetings. Meetings often feel like a waste of time, just something you need to endure before you can get back to your real job. But remember, as a manager, your output is equal to the output of your team and the teams you influence. You can increase or decrease output through one or more of the five managerial activities. One, information gathering. Two, information giving. Three, decision making. Four, nudging. And five, role modeling. Meetings are nothing more than a medium to do managerial work. You can do any of these activities inside or outside of meetings. Just choose the most high leverage medium for what you want to accomplish. The one that produces the most output for the least amount of work. If you choose a meeting as your medium, you need to understand what type of meeting it is. Meetings fall into two categories. One, process oriented. These meetings take place on a regular cadence and are designed to promote knowledge sharing and information exchange. And two, Mission-oriented. These are ad hoc meetings designed to solve a specific problem by making a decision. To maximize efficiency, infuse process-oriented meetings with regularity. Attendees should know how the session will run, what matters will be discussed, and what the goal is. By doing this, you ensure that the meeting has minimal impact on output. Process-oriented meetings come in three types. One, one one-on-ones. Meetings with you and a direct report. Two, staff meetings. Meetings with you and all your direct reports. And three, operation reviews. Meetings that allow people who don't frequently meet to meet. Operation reviews should include formal presentations where managers describe their work to other managers who aren't immediate supervisors and to peers in other parts of the company. One-on-ones are meetings between you and a direct report and are the primary way of maintaining and deepening your relationship. They can be incredibly high leverage. The hour you spend together can impact the direct report's work for weeks. The primary purpose of a one-on-one is mutual teaching and information exchange. You teach your team members your skills, know-how, and suggest ways to approach things, while they provide information about what they're doing and their concerns. Schedule one-on-ones based on the job or task relevant maturity of each report. Have frequent one-on-ones like once a week with those who are inexperienced in the specific situation, and less frequently, like once a month, for experienced veterans. Carve out at least an hour. Anything less tends to confine people to simple problems that can be solved quickly. A key thing to understand is that one-on-ones are the reports meeting. They should set the tone and agenda. This increases your leverage because you don't have to create a plan for each of your direct reports. It's also important because it forces them to think through what they want to talk about in advance. The meeting typically starts with indicators managed by the report, such as order rates, production output, or project status. Focus on indicators that signal trouble. You should also cover anything important that has happened since the last meeting. Hiring problems, people problems, organizational issues, and new plans. The criteria of inclusion is whether the issue bothers your subordinate. Your role is to learn and coach. When they have stopped talking, ask another question until you feel like you've gotten to the bottom of the problem. You should also Both have a copy of the agenda and take notes against it. Taking notes promotes active listening 
and ensures that the actions required by either party aren't lost. Consider using a hold file where you can both accumulate essential but not urgent issues to discuss in the future, and where possible, encourage heart-to-heart conversations. One-on-ones are the perfect forum for getting at subtle work-related problems. Schedule one-on-ones on a rolling basis, setting up the next one as the current one ends. This makes it easy to account for other commitments and avoids cancellations. Staff meetings involve you and your team members and allow peers to interact. Because of this, they're an ideal place for decision making. Anything impacting more than two people present is fair game. If something degenerates into a conversation between two people, break it off and move on to something that affects more people. Suggest the two book a separate meeting to discuss. Staff meetings should be relatively structured, with an agenda prepared ahead of time, so everyone has a chance to prepare. You should also include unstructured time, so people can bring up anything they want. If required, the things brought up in the unstructured time can become part of the agenda of a future meeting. Your role is to be the leader, observer, expediator, questioner, and decision maker when required. But ideally, you just keep things on track while your team works out issues. Operation reviews are the medium of interaction for those who don't otherwise have the opportunity to meet. They allow employees several organizational levels apart to teach and learn from each other. Operation reviews involve four groups. One, the organizing manager. They help presenters decide what issues and details to present, book the meeting, and other timekeeper. Two, the reviewing manager, a senior supervisor whom the review is aimed at. They ask questions, make comments, and are a role model for the junior managers who present. Three, the presenters. Presenters use visual aids where possible, dedicating four minutes of presentation and discussion to each slide. And four, the audience. Audience participation is key, so they should question and make comments. Mission-oriented meetings are ad hoc and designed to produce output, like a decision. The key to their success is the chairperson, who has the most at stake in the outcome. Usually, this is who calls the meeting. All too often, chairpeople turn up like any other attendee and hope things go as planned. This is why meetings often feel like a waste of time. You need to have a clear understanding of the meeting's objectives before you call it. So before calling a meeting, ask yourself, what am I trying to accomplish? And is a meeting necessary? If both answers aren't yes, then the meeting will be a waste of time. Likewise, if you are invited to a meeting and the requester can't answer these questions, get it cancelled. Meetings are expensive and time is finite. Assuming a meeting does need to happen, your role is to identify who should attend. If someone can't attend, see if they can send someone in their place. Remember, mission-oriented meetings are called for a specific purpose, so keep them to no more than six or seven people. Decision-making is not a spectator sport. If you call a meeting, you are responsible for the logistics, setting the agenda and writing the minutes. Once the meeting is over, you must share the minutes quickly before attendees forget what happened. They should be clear and as specific as possible, telling the reader what was decided, who is to do it, and when. You need to get attendees the minutes fast, before they forget what happened. If writing minutes is too much of a problem, the meeting wasn't worth calling in the first place. Ideally, you would never call mission-oriented meetings. In practice, 
Routine meetings should take care of 80% of problems. Ad hoc meetings are needed to deal with the rest. If you're spending more than 25% of your time in ad hoc meetings, that's a sign of poor organization.